We were just listening to President Biden delivering remarks after NATO declared Russia its most significant threat. The president is touting the addition of Finland and Sweden to the alliance and stressing the commitment of NATO and the United States to help Ukraine and defend, quote, every inch of NATO territory. For more, I want to bring in White House correspondent Mary Alice Parks, who's in Madrid, ABC News national security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy, ABC News contributor, former CIA senior operations officer Daryl Blocker, and foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burridge. For us in Kyiv, Ukraine. Mick, I want to start with you. The president talked about uh, the reconsidering the makeup of NATO and, and this addition of Finland and Sweden. How does that impact NATO and our national security here at home? So, Diane, that is a significant increase in NATO's military capacity. As the president mentioned, Finland and Sweden have very modern militaries. They have the most sophisticated weapon systems to include fifth generation fighters, and they're completely integrated with NATO already when it comes to military interoperability. So this was a significant add, uh, both politically and militarily, to the alliance. Uh, Mary Alice, it sounded like at least some of this address was really meant for Vladimir Putin's ears, with the president kind of emphasizing this, I told you so kind of tone. Yeah, exactly. He wants to say that this is exactly what President Putin didn't want, a stronger, more unified NATO, now an expanded NATO in the coming months with these two new countries joining. He's, that's, a, that's a message from this White House they've come back to a lot, that they were successfully able to unify NATO and that they're sending more U.S. troops and, and U.S. assets. I mean, it is not insignificant that we will have the first ever permanent headquarters of military troops on the eastern flank of NATO there in Poland. That is right on Russia's doorstep. That was something that Putin didn't want, and the United States is doing it anyway. Now, Daryl, uh, the president said NATO partners are also promising to spend at least 2% of GDP on defense going forward, some spending more than that. What's the practical impact of that? Well, the practical impact is the United States has been, been shouldering the burden financially for, for many, many years. So trying to get the other members to pony up what has long been established has been something that has just kind of gone by the wayside, but it is significant in the sense that the more that they meet their requirements, the less that the United States has to, and then the more integrating it becomes on the ground. Now, Tom, this comes amid a new weapons package to Ukraine from the U.S. with a new missile defense system. What more is Ukraine asking for from NATO at this point? And, and it sounds like the president was intimating there that there's another package to come as well. Yeah, Diane, I think my reality check on, on, on the sort of rhetoric coming out of the NATO summit, I think President Biden has sort of echoed that bold rhetoric throughout the summit uh, of standing up to Russia, giving Ukraine more support. Ukraine says it needs much more in terms of heavy weaponry. We're, we're hearing about much greater needs of the Ukrainian troops in terms of basic kit too. But my reality check is this. We've spoken to two Ukrainian troops, or one Ukrainian uh, fighter and a, an American fighting for the Ukrainians within the last couple of days. And both of those troops have withdrawn from positions in the east within the last 10 days. And they paint a picture of the fight being incredibly tough for the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians' lines being breached. The Ukrainian soldier who spoke to us today saying that in 24 hours, just before he retreated, his unit alone lost five soldiers and seven were injured. He lost his dad. That is what is happening out east. Russia is pushing back Ukraine. Although we have seen a little glimpse that weapons supplied by the U.S. and its allies are making a difference, Ukraine now taking that island out in the Black Sea called Snake Island, a tiny piece of territory, but significantly strategically important. And that might be a sign that the weapons are making a difference in this war. Uh, Mick, this also comes amid this increased U.S. military presence in Europe uh, in general. What's the role of those troops? Why send them there now? Well, Diane, I think it's primarily to send a message uh, that we are ready to defend NATO, absolutely. NATO's rapid reaction force is going to go from 40,000 to 300,000, a very significant increase. And the U.S. has already sent 20,000 additional troops. And now, for the president's uh, comments, we're sending significant air and naval assets as well. This is all to make sure that President Putin understands that NATO is fully capable and ready to defend itself should he decide to go further uh, than Ukraine. Uh, Daryl, we also heard the president say that Article 5 is sacred and that, quote, will defend every inch of NATO territory. And then he repeated, every 
inch. What message is the president trying to send with that emphasis? Well, I believe that Vladimir Putin's response that if the United States come in, then he will have to react. That will trigger, even with the new members, fin Finland and Sweden, or the new proposed members, that that is included in, in the NATO, um, I guess, in the psychology, in the terms of, of figuring out who we're going to defend. Every inch means Poland, because they've made threats against them, and all those countries in the Baltics that have also stepped up uh, against Vladimir Putin and his, and his actions. Uh, Tom, we also heard the president say that we are going to help Ukraine for as long as it takes. What is the current status of this war, and is there any sense for how long it could go on? Yeah, Diane, for me, that was probably one of the most illuminating moments. The president, understandably, not being drawn into crystal ball territory about what's going to happen here on the ground in Ukraine. And the reality is no official, no U.S. official, no Ukrainian official can look anyone in the eye and say what exactly is going to happen on the ground. And to reiterate it, out in the east right now, it is not going Ukraine's way. That said, Russia is taking territory very slowly. Western officials keen to point out that Russia is losing a lot of men in the fight out in the east. But anecdotally, what we're picking up, and from Ukrainian officials really going public with this over the last couple of weeks, is that the Ukrainians are really, really losing big in that fight out in the east. They're losing a lot of men. They are outgunned. They are outnumbered. And the key question now is, we've had all the big commitments from the US and its allies at this NATO summit. We know that they've already been delivering big weaponry, new types of weaponry. But at what point and when will that weaponry really make a difference out in the eastern Donbass? Will it allow the Ukrainians to really turn the tide? We just don't know, nor really do any politician in any capital city around the world right now. Uh, Mary Alice, the focus here was global issues, primarily Ukraine and Russia. But President Biden also made news by saying that after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, he now supports doing away with the filibuster to codify the right to privacy into law. That was the right that not only Roe v. Wade, but many other Supreme Court decisions have been built on. Uh, what do you make of that? What, what are the possible repercussions there? Yeah, Dan, this was definitely some news the president made right there at the end of this press conference. You know, the news, the decision from the Supreme Court has been hanging over this entire trip. He's wanted to focus on his foreign agenda. But, of course, the earth-shattering decision from the Supreme Court uh, has been occupying so everyone else's attention. And this was the first time the reporters were able to get questions to him on that issue. Uh, and he, he had to answer them. You know, the, the pressing question has been, what else is he going to do? What other executive actions? We've seen members from his own party, fellow Democrats, urging him to really push the envelope, think of other things he can do. You heard him say that he is going to meet with governors on Friday. They're going to explore other options, other potential executive actions. But he came back to this idea that what he really thinks is most important is for Congress to pass a national law codifying the protection, the right to an abortion and other privacy protections. Now, of course, to do that in the Senate, they would either need 60 votes or they'd have to change the rules of the filibuster. They'd have to carve out and be willing to pass some with only 50 votes uh, by, by making an exception to the filibuster. He's been careful before to say whether he'd be willing to go there, but you heard him today say that he would be. He thinks that voting rights and now this issue warrant that kind of rule change. So a little bit of news there, definitely, Diane. And then, Mary Alice, what happens if and when these branches of government change powers to the other party? Can they just, each party then just overturn what the last one passed? This is a great question, and people that are opposed to any changes to the filibuster say exactly that. They are worried that this just sets the stage for uh, so many more laws to be passed, so many uh, for less of that bipartisan check that the Senate normally provides. Uh, but, you know, I have to say Democrats are going increasingly eager to do this kind of thing. They are very worried that if Republicans were to take control of the House and the Senate, they would do this to pass a national ban. So there's this increasingly sort of alarmist language about what needs to be done. Democrats really pushing uh, for this kind of action. And I have to tell you, you know, that there used to be that 60 vote threshold to have to put someone on the Supreme Court. And a big part of this conservative majority was only built after Republicans went away, did away with that 60 uh, vote majority. They, they, I was sort of the beginning of breaking down the filibuster, and that left a really sour taste in Democrats' mouth. They've been eager to be able to start to break some of these rules themselves, to put some of their policies in place. 
And Mick, I want to go back to this NATO conversation, too, because the president obviously is touting the addition of Finland and Sweden, as so many NATO members are. But Turkey, for a while, was the lone holdout here. They did finally sign on, but presumably after getting some concessions. So what do we know about the deals made with Turkey in order to get their support for Finland and Sweden? And are there any risks there? So there was two main issues that I was tracking that Turkey was concerned about. One was their ability to get advanced fighters, even though they have the Russian air defense system, the S-400. I think there was a breakthrough on that. And then there was some also discussions about our continued cooperation with the SDF, which is the group uh, that we've been partnered with in Syria that led to the defeat of ISIS and now is key in the enduring defeat of ISIS. I would hope that nothing has changed there. That is a key partner. We need to stay with them. We need to work with Turkey to ensure that their security concerns are met. But, but it looks like there was some breakthrough, and it's a good thing uh, that Turkey agreed with the membership of Sweden and Finland in NATO. All right, Mary Alice Parks, Tom Sufi Burge, Gerald Blocker, Mick Mulroy, thank you all. We'll be right back. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.